Uh, we're going to go over a few lighting equipment things. Um, this is like the first half of the lighting equipment. The next half will be done next week. This one focuses, this one's not all like for the lighting department, electrical department. Um, some of it is actually for the grip department, but since those two kind of go hand in hand, especially on lower budget sets, you might have those two crews be the same thing. I'm just putting it together for us to look at. Since I was looking at it more as like a independent, we do it ourselves kind of, uh, kind of thing. Well, I think it's good to be independent and do certain stuff yourself. Also be open to like letting other people do stuff too, because at the end of the day, you can be as independent as you can, but it's such really, it's a team effort and you need. Oh yeah, yeah no, I wasn't saying that. I was saying for, okay. for lower budgets, you, you might yeah. not have a separate lighting department and a separate grip department. Those might be yeah. combined into one. On that makes sense yeah. on a smaller stuff yeah they start the more people they, you have the more it becomes individualized and you can separate these things but when you have a smaller budget you usually can't get a huge crew so then it has to start having people wear multiple hats that makes sense and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that i think that's actually a great way to learn and be hands-on um and then as you grow and you need more hands and you grow that's when you get more hands i agree so the first thing that we're looking at is what's called a soft box. We were looking earlier where at diffusion, this is one of the ways that you get that diffused light makes a softer look, which is why it's called a soft box. It's material that wraps around the light. The light actually starts at the left right here, that little aperture 300. Um, and then it, the light goes into that. You put the soft box around that. And then there's a layer of diffusion or two layers of diffusion that the light goes through to soften the light. And so they look like on the inside. So they have all these reflective surfaces so that the light's bouncing around, but it's going right back to the front. That way it's not spreading out everywhere. So it is also more controlled when you put a soft box on a light. There are a ton of different sizes and shapes of soft boxes. The larger the soft box, the softer the light's gonna appear. And then there's also some that are harder to set up. You have to like, they have separate pieces, some kind of look, some kind of come sort of like this. I think this one's kind of like where it's kind of like an umbrella. You just push the thing down and the whole thing expands open. But other ones like the ones I have, you have to put individual poles into the corners to set it up. So it does take a little bit longer and it's a little bit harder to set up, but um, either way, they're not that bad. Um, it just depends on how quickly you want to set it up and how often you're going to be using it and how quickly you'll need it right when you're trying to use it. Sometimes the soft box will have two layers of diffusion that'll just make the light softer. So whenever you're going out to look for a soft box, if you're gonna buy lighting equipment, check and see online, like look on YouTube videos and see what the two layers of diffusion look like versus the one, because um, you can always take one out. It'll probably be a little more expensive if you get the one with two layers, but it also might make it look exactly like what you're going for. And you might want to have one of each. So it just depends on what you want. Um, but just keep in mind that there are different types and different kinds. So whenever you're going out to look for one, some are going to make the light look a lot softer and a lot more diffused than others. You also have um, what's called like, I think it's called a grid. And that's that little black thing on the front. It's kind of like a honeycomb. And that will control the light a little better, making it go um, and it, it won't expand outward as much. It'll go straight towards whatever your subject is. It'll also block a little bit of the light, bringing it down, you know, a little bit, making it a little darker, uh, not too much. But it does. the main thing it does is control the light from going side to side so that it just goes to where you want it, like your subject, instead of spilling out as much on the background. And I think those are attachable. So I think you can get them for kind of any softbox you want. I don't think it's a uh, specific ones, but there might be, I'm not sure exactly. This kind of shows you like the difference of the diffusion fabric that's used. Um, like the mono layer, which would be the single layer of diffusion is in the middle and then the double layers on the right. Of course, the more diffusion you add, if you don't have a light that's um, dimmable or you can't brighten it up, then you're gonna lose some of that that um, 
exposure, the exposure level will go down a bit, the more diffusion you add and the light will get softer. So if you get, if you do want more diffusion, you're gonna have to have a brighter light so that you can meet that same exposure level. So there's a different size, different um, shapes of soft boxes as well. There's like the square rectangular ones. Mm -hmm. There's the, this is kind of like the one I have. So it's like a square one and you see the poles in the corners, you put them on the inside and then you put it on the inside of the thing. It's kind of like setting up a tent and you put it to the light and it just expands that outward. And then you put that cloth layer over it, giving it the diffusion. There's also circular ones. There's actually have a picture of a few different ones. So you guys can see this. Well, it's kind of a small picture, but you can see like the different sizes and the different kinds. They say that the ones that are more rectangular are better for like a top to bottom lighting, like lighting somebody's feet to their head. And the circular ones are better at focusing on like one individual area. Um, and then of course, again, the bigger they are, the softer the light's gonna be because the bigger the light will look to your subject and the bigger it'll be compared to your subject. I mean, and that makes the light softer. Um, but it doesn't really give off any extra light. They kind of, they showed a video, one of the videos showed that the, the smaller and the bigger soft boxes, if you pointed out a wall, the, it's gonna be lit up, the same distance will be lit up from like the left to the right. Um, the only thing that changes is the quality of the light, which is when it gets softer or harsher. And that's when it comes into play, when you want the bigger ones for softer light, smaller ones for harsher light and all, all different sizes for in between. The bigger ones you're also able to like kind of bring back away from the subject a little more and it'll still light them up um, with, you know, it'll still have that good diffusion and the smaller ones you might have to bring in closer to get them a little bit um, to have it be the same size compared to the subject so that it gives that same softness. Little ones are also easier to have for small spaces, of course, big ones, big ones can go really big where it's kind of cumbersome. And if it's a small room, you might not be able to, it might be really hard to fit the big giant ones in. Something like that picture right here. If you have something like that on the right, it's gonna, it's really big. So you have to make sure you have enough space and it's not gonna get in frame and all of that kind of thing. Uh, this shows like the egg crate all the way to the right. That's kind of what it looks like with the egg crate when you put that, the thing that kind of like a, kind of looks like a honeycomb. Um, that's her on the right with that. And then with just the one layer of diffusion, that's the second one from the left right here. Double layer of diffusion is the one right here, third one from the left. So that kind of gives you a different sense of, of what it looks like if it's all from the same distance and at the same brightness level. So it just depends on what kind of look you're going for. Especially if you're going for a more moody look, you definitely want to get like something a little more, I mean, you'd probably have a little bit harsher stuff going on, but also you'd want it to be in a little darker, double layer fusion if you wanted like a soft light, but you wanted it a little darker in the room, you'd get maybe something like that. Or you'd just find a way to like block out the light with flags and stuff like we'll talk about in a second. This just shows some of the different kinds of looks you can go for with the same lights from different distances. And this different shapes of the soft boxes, which make them all look different. So lighting is very, uh, you can like make it look different really easily just from moving the light back and forth, turning up the brightness and putting something over the um, over the lens and blocking out light from certain directions. There's a lot of things you can do to make it look completely different. And that's why you have all these pictures coming from like the same source. It's the same light kind of, it's just different shapes of soft boxes, making her look different in almost every single one. Yeah, 
The other th main thing about the shape of the soft boxes, if you look at the bottom pictures right here, is the catch light, what's called catch light, and that's what the light looks like coming from somebody's eyes. So the circular ones will have the circular catch light, looks a little bit more like the sun. So we're a little bit more used to like a circular catch light in somebody's eyes when we're outside. So that looks a bit more natural to us. And the square ones look a bit, you know, a little bit less because we're not used to square shapes of light as much as we are um, circular ones. Now, if you're in like a hospital or something and they have the square lights in the ceiling, you'll probably see somebody with a rectangle or a square in their in their eyes from the lights from above. But because the sun is more natural, you know, well, the sun is natural. <laughs> we we are more used to the circular catch light being in somebody's eyes. But this shows a bunch of the different shapes um, and how it looks in comparison to each other. If you just pay attention to all the different views. Some of these are what's called, I think they call them umbrellas, where they actually shine the light into them and it reflects back into the subject. And some of them are the soft boxes like we're talking about, either a single layer or double layer of diffusion. That makes sense. They all it's give cool. off like a different look, a different amount of shadow, you know, a different amount of softness. No, it's cool. That all makes kind of cool sense. It's it's cool to see how much you can really do and and affect how you know you paint the picture or, or like take the picture pretty much. But it's kind of like painting a picture because you get to change the tone, the look, everything if you're really good. And it's, I think that's super cool. Right. And it's so cool to see like how much you can really control it the more you know about it and the more you use different materials and different, you know, equipment. Uh, she said you have your hand raised. Yeah. So from what I understand, this is basically used to like, not only control the mild light, but focus it on a subject. So like, would this really only be used for like scenes that have like close-ups or something? Because it looks like they're only really used to be used on one subject, not really. Well, like- um, They can be used for multiple things. You, you can have, um, they, they are, um, I wouldn't say they're not used on other things because it depends on how soft you want your light to look, no matter where it is in the room and how you want to set it up. If you have a character running around a scene and they're going all over the place in the room, you'll probably want, and you, you want it to look consistent. So you're not going to have um, you know, like harsh lights in, in one part and these soft boxes with, or diffusion or something somewhere else. But you might have, you might have like a, a bright light shine through a door and then have a layer of diffusion so that it kind of matches the, the soft boxes. But I've seen sets where they have multiple soft boxes set up all around the room. And lighting oh, okay. subjects. Because I'm thinking, because the examples have like, because these examples only have one person. So I'm thinking, like, oh, are they only used for close ups or anything? Or, All right. Yeah. One of the problems I've been finding with like lighting is a lot of it goes to portrait photography. So it, it does have like that one subject sitting down and you look at it while they change it. It's the easiest way to show you the differences, though. Um, but, but when you're watching like a, an actual scene, and you go to the behind the scenes, you can see they use like these big, huge umbrella lights or they use diffusion or they use reflectors. They use all sorts of things, but they usually want it like consistent look all around. That makes sense. I mean, you know, if consistency for like the whole scene and what you're playing at is probably the best way to be because then it just helps tell the story. And then you can purposely change a look for like flashbacks and things like that. And it becomes fun. Yeah. That's yeah, I heard like the three point the three point lighting that we're talking that like we were talking about um, mm -hmm. usually is talking about soft boxes or something like that where it has one behind one to the side and one to the other side a little bit dimmer the fill light. Yeah. What are they again? Key light, backlight, and a fill light. Fill light. Thank you. Almost yep. there. Key light, backlight, fill light. Fill light. <laughs> There's also these things called like parabolic soft boxes, and they're they're said that they don't spill out as much on the background as like an octagon soft box, which is just a different shape. Octagon soft box, like something like that. 
and then the I think the parabolic is is not just the shape it's like a different it's a deeper I know it's deeper so you see it's like it's very it's very deep so it has the light and it usually has two layers of diffusion I believe for most of them and so that's another thing to look at if you're trying to to get one you can see what the difference is and you can see kind of right here what the difference is um I think parabolics on the left or no I'm well I wish I would say there you go you can kind of see the difference right there the octo octobox on the left parabolic on the right it gives off a different look it's a bit softer because of the double layer of diffusion so there's not as harsh of shadows above her eyes and around her cheekbones and underneath her neck. Um, I think that was everything I wanted to say. And then you can also bring the, you know, any soft box you have, you can always bring it closer to make the light softer as well before it gets into frame. But the closer <laughs> it is, the softer the light's going to look because it's going to wrap around that subject a lot better. Any other questions or comments on that? Not at the moment. And yeah, the soft box is not that expensive either. Yeah, I have some. Uh, I bought like a set of three a few years ago. I don't know how good the quality is, but um, it was just like, it was like, yeah, it was about 200 or something like that. And it, it was three lights, one with the big, huge arm like that. And it has a little sandbag and then the two side lights. I would just look into like the reviews and stuff to make sure that they don't go off a, a green hue. Because I've heard some of the cheaper ones can, depending on the light bulb you have, gives off a slight green hue on the person, which makes them look a little more sickly than they would if you had like a higher end um, soft box or light bulb or whatever is causing that green hue. But for the most part, they're not really that bad, especially for like a huge kid of them. But yeah, so that's why you have the cinematographer and the gaffer really talking about how they're gonna get these um, lighting setups. Because you might have them point a light through a window, but they want it to be this softness and they want it to look blue. And so they put gels on it or, you know, there's so many different things you, they do to give it a specific look, um, and which is why there's so many people working on it. And the director also gives their input on if they like it or not, or if they want to change, or sometimes they might give a specific look they really want. If they know what they're, the technical side of things, they might give the technical way of what they want for certain shots. Um, <clears throat> and so that's why lighting is so important and why it changes so much, depending on who's doing it, because there's so many different ways of doing it just by changing a few different details, even if it's the same brightness. Next thing we're talking about is reflectors. Reflectors are used in cinematography and photography. They're an improvised or specialized reflective surface used to redirect light toward the subject of the scene, which also softens it up. You saw this, uh, I think last week, we were talking a little bit about this. Main ones that people talk about are always these five in one. Um, there's different sizes of them. And again, it's like the size the bigger it is, the softer it's going to look because it's going to be bigger compared to your subject. These five in one kits, they're, I don't know how much, I don't think they're like that much at all. Um, hold on, let me check. They're very cheap, and everyone says that, you know, every single person should have one. Yeah, it's just like, you know, 20, 40 bucks, 50 bucks if you're going for the bigger ones. Um, you know, and it, it can get more expensive depending on what you're trying to get. But these five and one things are not that bad. And they have these different sides because the, the, the middle is just a layer of diffusion. So if you just need a little bit of diffusion, then it already has that. If you don't need like something specific, 
like an actual like a soft box or you don't need a you know that, those other materials for diffusion like we learned about last week this thing will come with a, a thin layer of diffusion which will help make it a little bit softer looking the silver side will give off a, a more harsh light but it will reflect a little better so it'll be brighter so if you really need light sun's going down or something and you're outside you can reflect the light back into the subject and it'll you know it'll reflect the most light gold will reflect the light but it'll look a little gold it'll change it to look a little warmer white will be the most true to whatever source you have and the black is for what's called negative fill which is kind of taking the light away if you want to make a side darker you want to stop these lights bouncing off the wall and coming back to their face you can put this black side over on that side so that it stops and gives them more shadow instead of like giving them more light. You look at that, the, uh, the bottom shows you kind of what the different looks will do. So the silver side's the bottom left. The white side is the next one, this, the diffusion layer is in the middle. Black side is on the, is the next one over and then the gold side is to the right. So you see how the gold adds, makes her look a lot more yellow a lot more warm, but how each side changes the picture and makes her look different in each one. This again shows the differences a little bit closer up. Um, it shows like how the gold can make them look a little darker gold. No reflectors top left, negative fill on the right. You can see the shadows are a little bit more on the top, especially like right underneath his hat. It's a little darker, a little deeper, and underneath his uh, chin. And you have the silver reflector, lights up his face a lot, and the white reflector that's kind of giving him a neutral look. Awesome. Because so these are so cheap and because they are so adaptable and you know they're easy to fold down, they're kind of just like those car um, shades that you put up on your windows. And you can just fold it down into a little circle, zip it up into a little pack, and then you have it. And then you bring it everywhere you go. So everyone who does photography and um, cinematography says to have one of these. You also have like these big sheets and stuff that you can put on these, these um, C stands or whatever kind of stands these are, um, where you have like a bigger area to make it softer looking or make it give off more light if you need it. This is another comparison. They also have these things, um, I can't remember the name of those, bounce boards, I think they're called, which actually, they're pretty expensive for what they are, but they can set up like on the actual ground and they're taller than your subject. So it gives off a really nice soft light, bounces off of this thing and goes back into them. And you can fold it however you want so that it, well, you can like, you know, make it wider or skinnier to make the light do different things. Um, and to get it as close to them as possible without being in frame. And it also has the black side if you want to do negative fill to get more shadows and stop light from bouncing back. And that's kind of showing what it would look like if you're using that. So you can see there's a little bit more shadow on her, on her left side, our screen right, um, because of those black sides. You're getting a little bit more shadow on that side of her face because the light's coming from that side, I guess they don't want it to bounce off the wall and come back into her, and brighten it up even more. So they put the black side over there, the white side over on the other side to bounce that light back into her, her face from, from, the, uh, from her right, which is our screen left, um, and the black side so that no light bounces back off there and, and makes it even brighter. So you can see how that's kind of affecting the shadows underneath her hair and on the right side of her face. There are left. So she has the key over here and they're using the bounce board as the fill. I also seeing, I saw this, I thought it was interesting that guy is like, he's kind of folding it into itself to cause it to make a different look. I wish they'd show us a comparison. I couldn't find one, but I thought it was interesting how they're showing 
you can even like, you know, fold it in different ways to make the sun or whatever light you're using reflect back into your subject a different way to give it a more, um, to give it a different kind of look so that it's not just straight on. So there's also a lot of different things you can do with these to be creative. Um, let me check my notes a second. I say you can also, if you want to use these and you want to keep the quality of light the same, you don't want it to get softer or harsher. So you don't want to change your camera settings by, you know, closing your aperture down to make it darker. You can use polarizers or ND filters so that you can use the reflector, have it be as soft or as harsh as you want, and then just use the ND filters to keep the quality of light the same, but make it look darker to the camera. So that way you don't have to mess with the settings and change the background, make it less blurry and all those things with the camera settings. Oh, also, as he's holding it, you that's usually what you wanna do if you're outside with one of these and you're trying to reflect light into somebody's face. You wanna reflect it from above. A lot of people you'll see they're reflecting it, they're holding the thing down and reflecting it back up into their face. And that's a little bit unnatural looking because the light, we're used to light coming from above. So the light that's going and bouncing off of this and reflecting back into your subject should be coming from above as well. If you have it coming from below, it can cause some unnatural shadows that we're not used to. And it can make somebody look a little ghoulish or scary because it's creating these dark shadows um, around their eyes and things like that, that don't look natural to us. Also, you can have somebody holding the reflector. If the person's moving around a lot, they can, you know, move it, move the um, reflector around to make sure the light stays on them. Or you can use something like a C stand or another kind of stand to actually hold it up if you're doing it all yourself. As long as the um, the subject is kind of standing still or not moving around too much, like going from side to side, you can do it. You can always do it and then just change where the, uh, the light and the reflector is. You just have to call cut a little earlier. But yeah, yeah. Does anyone have any questions or comments about that? Also, this is what a C stand is. It's kind of just like a stand where there's two poles and you just loosen one of the arms and the arm goes up so that it's sideways so you can put like those scrims or those reflectors or whatever you want on the pole so that you have something for it to hold. And they say if you're using one of these, if you see like the three legs are like this, you always want the tallest leg to be in front wherever the, the weight is going. So if you have something hanging off of this side, like on here, on this picture, um, then you, that's why that big leg is going the same direction because it'll hold it the best and it won't fall over. If you turn this to the side and put it in between these legs, it's going to fall straight flat. So you always want the leg pointed out wherever your weight is going to make sure it doesn't fall over. So like, are these, so these are used to like, like um, to reflect as much light or whatever um to the subject are, le are these like the kind of lights they use when like like for example let's say it's in a horror movie and the scene is obviously dark but there's still enough light for you to see like the characters and stuff like is this what they use because there's yeah. some movies normally they like do yeah because like they they have a light coming from somewhere um especially if the light's coming from behind them to give them that you know nice outline on their head They'll usually use either another light or if they want it to look a little more natural, they use something like this to just have the light hit this, reflect back into the subject so that you can still see them. Okay, because I think there's some, I mean, then again, I think there was there's some movies where like, I just couldn't see what was going on and not like they did it intentionally. Like I think mm -hmm. one time I was watching um, The Dark Knight. Then again, the video quality was really bad. So that could have done it too. But I really could, there were some scenes where I really couldn't see what was going on. It's like, and I was wondering, there's no way it's this dark. So I'm thinking that was more of my video quality than anything. But like, yeah, so that's what I was thinking about. Like when they want to shoot like a horror scene or something, how much to, 
like do they use these and control the light yeah, yeah um they also sometimes even if you have multiple lights i've seen them use this just to kind of you know control it a little better and, and point it in the direction they want it to go so that the person could be lit up a bit a little bit especially if there's a bright background then you really need to light up your subject to um, even out those exposure levels so that the background's not blown out or like you said the the foreground is too dark and you can't even see what's going on so they usually try to um, get as much light without making it look unrealistic on the subject if it's a bright background so that they can even out those exposure levels and everything looks good. Um, or they use, you know, the reflector from the, like if there's a window coming in and they can use a reflector to bounce the light back into the person so that they have some, um, some light so they're easier to see. All right, right when you because right when you start adding in actual lights like if it's not just a light from behind them if it's if you're trying to light them from the front and you're not wanting to use a reflector then you're going to need another light source and if it's shining towards them it could create shadows and stuff like that there are ways to go around that by doing like negative fill and what we're going to look at in a second these these flags and stuff but but it depends on how dark you want your scene and everything, because when you have a light source, it's going to shine in multiple directions, whether you notice it or not. It's going to, you know, right when you get into a really dark room, right when you turn on the light, it's going to go everywhere. So to really control it, and if they really want it really dark, sometimes they'll just use a reflector and have a backlight and have the light reflect back into the subject. And the next thing we're talking about is what's called scrims. Scrims are basically just the material that's used for diffusion. Um, it's a device, television and film, as well as for photographers, and it modifies the properties of light. There are different variations of the type of scrim depending on its use, whether it's natural light or man-made light sources. Scrims designed to diffuse light use translucent material to transform hard light into soft source. When constructed of woven fabric, they are often referred to as silks. While there are many pre-designed options available, you can, far, you can further open up creative possibilities by purchasing an open frame and securing your favorite diffusion material inside of it. For the example below, Translum was used. And so like this kind of thing will be, they have the, what's called the scrim, which is just that diffusion material, but it's um, spread out and it's like in a big, huge square on the sides and above her. And then they have the negative black scrim material to go on the other sides to block the light from um, bouncing back in those directions. So she has light coming from above, light coming from the side. Um, and then they also have that negative fill with the black so that they give off the key light and the fill light look. Very cool. I like that. It's a cool setup. Yeah, it's cool seeing like, like as you go, like it ends up being bigger and bigger um, setups. I've seen a lot of like the really big setups and it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. the bigger, <laughs> yeah, the, there's crazy like huge sets that you see that have these huge different materials just to like try to control <laughs> something as much as they can. Yeah, and I know it's like people like, oh, it's just lighting or it's just grip or whatever. But I mean, you have to know exactly where to set up all the equipment, how every piece works, how it all comes together. And I yeah. think there's some creativity that's involved in every single department in film. Oh, yeah, definitely. And hard work. And I just like, yeah, oh, let definitely. me see you. Let me, not you, Sarah, but I mean, like, some people are like, oh, it's that easy. Yeah, you, you do it. So, um, one thing that, it was even a misconception that I had was that the boom operator just held the thing. And no, he does a lot, actually. A lot more than just holding the thing. So it's just interesting that we sometimes get a little like, oh, that's all they do, probably. Um, yeah, I think sometimes like with the boom pole and stuff, sometimes it's fun to just like throw in like jokes like, oh, you're just the guy that holds Cool. like you know that that's not all that they do you're just poking fun but yeah but some people actually fun. do and that's what I was like 
Wow. Hey, some people know, think yeah. filmmaking is just picking up a camera and shooting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's oh, crazy. Boy, boy, boy. That's when you really, is when you think you know everything is when you know nothing. When you start to know mm-hmm. something, you realize how much you really you know nothing. <laughs> Right. Yeah. You realize how much you still need to learn. <laughs> yeah, and you'll never learn it all. It's like martial arts. You'll never learn it all. It's in- inconceivable. Like, how we vampires going to live 10,000 years? Then you might have a shot. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> in a hundred year lifespan, there's no fucking way. Even if you cram. Oh, yeah. that's the one thing about life is like, it- it's never ending. You can never run out of things to learn about. Right. That's why I like it so much to you'd always have something new and especially when you're on set there's always new challenges that present themselves i agree too that's part of reason i like it as well as i like i'm a person that i like consistency um but i like variety of films both of those because you could be like i do film and then you have consistency with variety mixed in and i think that that's the coolest part because it's like you have both it's all like interwoven together. It's just like some people are very boxed in and they're like, oh, I just have one thing and this is how we do it all the time. And then other people are more creative and I'll be like, I have this one thing, but with that one thing, I do a lot of things. Yeah. Oh, just tell me you're, you're uh, raised your hand. Yeah. Okay. I feel like this is a dumb question, but like just so I could, just so there I know. There's no such thing as dumb questions. I don't believe that. <laughs> um, just okay. Just so I know, so I can have a clear picture. When you say it diffuses the light, like what are you like? What are you talking about? So a diffusion, it makes the light look softer. Um, let me show you a thing. Well, if I spelled light right, it might come up. <laughs> you didn't spell light right. I spelled. Yeah. Oh, I did it sort of, but. Oh, wait, Man, that's not stupid. a good Maybe I'll put harsh versus soft. I'm so disappointed. My husband can't even spell the light right. So if you look at the top picture, you'll see like the that's harsh light, which would be just it coming out of the bulb. Like if you had it bare and you were just shining it into somebody. Um, and then the one on the right is more like, it's not really that good of a picture, but it shows how the light kind of wraps around her, stops having that harsh shadow, it cuts off where she can't even really see the left or well, the right side of her. And it kind of blends into the background. The soft light will um, give her a better look, less harsh shadows and kind of wrap around her a little better. And that's what the quality of light is. So that whenever you have diffusion, it adds this soft light so that it stops having all these harsh shadows or this quick drop off of light on whatever side of the, the light is coming from. Like the soft light right here, where there's no shadow in the background. She still has a shadow in this background on the soft light side, but it is a lot more diffused. So you can't see it as well. It's not as clear. It's not as harsh. And that's what the diffusion is. Okay. So, because when you were saying, I was trying to understand, like, I think I had a general picture, but like, I, when you kept saying diffuse the light, I would. Because I'm taking like biology, so that's what I'm thinking about. But obviously, it's not the same thing. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, I got you. Um, yeah, it, it basically it just makes the light appear bigger, and it kind of sends it out everywhere instead of having it be so directional. It kind of just takes it and and makes it spread out a little more, and it um it makes it appear larger. Um, Because the the smaller the light is compared to your subject, the harsher it looks, which is why when you get the larger soft boxes and stuff like that, when they go through the diffusion, the light's going to look bigger, even though really the light is um, just a little light bulb because it has that big, huge sheet, that white sheet that it's going through. It makes the light look like it's that big, huge white sheet, and that becomes your new light source in a way, which makes the light softer looking okay. that makes sense yeah yeah thank you okay yeah so one of the popular things with these scrims is what's called a butterfly that's like this thing right here butterfly scrims are these big huge things they're pretty expensive really expensive for what they are i feel like but um you know you'll see these on big sets and stuff like that you'll see these or even like you know pretty good independent films 
especially when they're shooting stuff outside, they'll have something like this, or they'll have these big black ones like this to block the sun or to diffuse the sun and make it kind of try to control it and shape it the way they want it to be. And these butterflies are just these little stands that you can kind of pop out and it creates a square where you can put the material, the scram material on the corners and then you can attach it kind of like, um, kind of like a trampoline and you just attach to each side of the pole so that it, it stays um, nice and straight or nice and flat and that diffuses the light the best. There's also do it yourself versions where, you know, they've shown like people just get some kind of pulls from, you know, uh, a home, home Depot or some other department, home department store. And they get like four poles and these four connectors, and then they just put it all together and make a square. And then they get people have used shower curtains you know, white t-shirts, any kind of white material will work. It'll all just give off a different look and it might not look as, as good as one of these, or it might look better depending on what you're going for. Um, but you, there's a lot of do-it-yourself versions of these, all these lighting materials and things. If you just look it up on YouTube, they actually look pretty good. Um, just looking at it and seeing the differences. So you don't always have to go for like these huge, expensive, crazy versions. These are just what are out there for you know the, the people who want it to be a little easier, who don't want to create it for themselves. And it, it gives off a different look. It might look a little better to some people, just preference. Um, my preference, I think it does look better, but it, I don't know if it's worth it. It doesn't, I don't know if it looks better enough to where I would spend that much money unless I was, you know, on a bigger budget. So keep that in mind when you're going out and looking at these things too. You don't always need the biggest and best stuff. Sometimes just a t-shirt or something like that will work. And that's where the creative process also comes in tackling problems like that, where you're like production budget and everything you have to be creative with how you're going to go about getting all your shots the way you want them without the budget to get these huge expensive equipment like i was saying though the light behind this sheet is hitting this white sheet and that's creating it making that huge white square be the new light and so these scrims will act as the new light which makes it bigger compared to her which makes it softer light going on to her material you choose for a scrim will depend on whether your goal is to simply reduce the intensity of the light source or diffuse it as well there's there's what's called wire scrims which are also known as nets they'll reduce the light by a predetermined number of stops depending upon the density of the mesh like how thick and how how much there is of the wires going back and forth, wire mesh. Um, and they will leave the overall character of the light unaffected, which means they're not gonna make it softer or harsher looking. They're just gonna kind of make it a little less bright. The exposure will go down without changing how soft or how, how harsh it is. A hard light source will remain hard, but its impact will decrease when a scrim is applied. Wire scrims are most often used with sources that do not have variable output, which means you can't dim them or brighten them up, such as large HMIs or the sun. So something like that, like just these kind of see-through, it's kind of like a window shade or um, what is it called? The bug, where the bugs can't come through. Oh, dang it, you, I forgot, but I know what you mean. Yeah, it's kind of like that. So it's going to make it look darker, but it's not going to change how harsh it is or how soft it is to the subject. So all you want to do is take down the brightness of the light and you can't dim it or brighten it up because that light doesn't work like that. Then you just get one of these, put it in front of it, and then less light will be hitting your subject, meaning it will be a little darker, but it won't change how, uh, how it looks. There's also ones that can go over the actual light itself, these little circular ones. Um, and I think I have a note somewhere that says, I think like green is two stops and red is one. I'll check in a minute. Oh man. In general, all traditional lights come with scrims, also known as wire. 
and horribly misnamed by rental houses as diffusion. And that's because these wire ones are not diffusing the light. Like we just said, they're going, they're just making it less bright. Um, diffusion would make it softer and make it disperse more and, and give that softer look. So only when they're a fabric um, scrim, like the butterflies, those big square ones, um, those are the ones that diffuse the light. The wire ones that go on the actual light itself or go in front of it, just make it less bright. Scrims are wire mesh discs that fit perfectly in front of the lens of a light. Scrims take down the intensity of the light without affecting the quality of it. If you dim a light, it will also get warmer for tungsten or bluer for HMIs. If you diffuse a light, it will also get softer. So scrims are used when you like the look and color of the light, but you only want less intensity while keeping everything else the same. And that's when these wire ones are used. Oh, that's the other thing. If you're using like a scrim that has a slight color to it, it'll change the color of the light. So oh, if, it's a, no. if it's a yellow one, it'll make it look a little gold. And if it's a white one, it'll have the most, it'll look the most like the white light that's coming from the source. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions or comments on that? And that would be technically, I think that's technically the grip department that uses scrims. They're the ones who shape the light and set up all of these things that are uh, helping to block light or shape the light. And the electrical department are the ones plugging it all in and setting up the actual lights themselves. Um, so I don't know, you know, like I said, it probably depends on production to production who does what, but I'm, I'm technically speaking, I think the grip department uses these scrims and flags and all of these devices to block and shape the light. Uh, yeah, they would be setting, uh, kind of probably setting everything up and then the lighting, de depending on the equipment, I think the lighting department's the one that's gonna be more in charge of like how it actually looks, but they're doing the lights. So I think the scrims and stuff is grips. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's that's what, what, I've, what I've seen, yeah. Gotcha. So yeah, so this is technically the, the grip department then. And then flags is the last thing. Flags are another material. They're just, they're kind of like scrims, but you have solid flags, which are completely black to block the light from going in certain directions. If you look at this picture, they have the light coming from the ceiling and they don't want it spilling all over the walls. So they're putting up these flags, these black material all around the light so that it just goes down onto the person and the walls still look dark. Light control flags are thick pieces of colored material, usually black or white, stretched over metal frames. Flags feature steel fabric, certain plastics, and other materials. Positioning flag cutters at certain angles allows you to control light direction and intensity with more accuracy, which means if you don't want it to spill off on those walls, you put them around the light so that it doesn't go to the walls, just down in that direction you want it to go. That makes sense. Flags device used in lighting for motion picture and still photography to block light. It can also be used to cast shadow, provide negative fill, or protect the lens from flare. So sometimes if you have something like that, you'll have it on a stand, you'll have some black material. You don't want it on the background, but you do want it on your subject. You'll raise it or lower it or move it around to a certain area until that light doesn't hit the background and it only goes to the subject you're pointing it towards. So it's a really good way to control the light and everyone should have some kind of black material. I've seen do it yourself where they use, you know, black trash bags, black t-shirts again, stuff like that. So if you don't actually have the actual materials, um, you can still find a ways to use everyday do it yourself materials around the house to, to get the same effect or something similar. And they're using it just like that. That would be like shining it at your subject, which would be a little BB-8 action figure or whatever that is. And um, they're using that black material to block it from getting on the wall or behind BB-8. So it just looks like the sun or the light is coming from the top left of him and casting a shadow right behind it. Oh, that's so cute. It reminds me of a, I, I painted a little picture of um, BB-8 before. 
Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> it's something special. Yeah, it was kind of fun. I like to do those kinds of things sometimes, occasionally. Paint yeah. a little picture give it to someone. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks. So like the closer it is to the light, the more it'll, you know, the more it'll block. So if you are trying to block it from the background, you might not want to put it too, too far away from the light because then it starts to just cast a shadow and it's really obvious that something's there. So you obviously you'd have to like move it closer and figure out a way to get it. That's why you have these C stands and these other things that hold it and you can adjust it up, down, left, right, move it all around to where you can get it exactly in the right spot so that it doesn't do um so that it doesn't cast a shadow like that and make it super obvious that you're using one the other thing these do really good i've seen is they when you when you shine a light on somebody and you don't want them to have a shadow they'll use these flags to block that light from whatever direction it's coming from that gives that shadow they'll block it so that it doesn't have a shadow anymore the background looks um the same and you still have that light shining on the person it's really good in those situations because you don't want to try to cancel out a shadow with another light because that just creates even more shadows on the other side and it's a really big mess. So just blocking the light from certain directions is the easiest way to go when you're trying to control um, where you want it to go and where you don't want it to go. This is just an example. He's showing how he put it up and now the background is not lit, but she still is. So that's kind of like what we were talking about. There's shadows everywhere, but you can't see it um, because the background isn't lit up, casting that shadow where you can see the shadow, where the rest of it's all lit up. Since he put that flag in the way, everything has a shadow, so you don't notice that there's a shadow coming from her chair, like you can see in the bottom right. This is just showing like how you can set it up to block light from going certain directions. They put it above him because they don't want the light spilling out that way. And that way it's just going on him from, um, from where they want it to come from. They also have these big, um, I can't remember what these are called, but they actually, they go on top and they have a layer that goes down. They even have three sided. So it kind of like boxes the person in or the subject in so that the light doesn't go anywhere but where, but right in the middle. And there's gonna be no light coming from the sides or from the top. Um, so these are really good to use when you're, when you're really needing to control that light. You don't want it to bounce off of any walls or any ceiling or anything. And you only want it to go right in that middle of the frame. Um, they so use something like this or a three-sided version of this to box it in. And then of course, there's just different sizes and different kinds, like with all these other materials and tools. So you can get a huge version, you can get small versions, circle, square, rectangle, all sorts. Try to figure out how to block the light as best you can. They're called flags, I'm assuming, because they're just, you know, they look like little square flags. If you put them up on those C stands and you raise them up, they just look like little flags. I'm assuming that's the reason, but I don't know. Not not hundred percent on that. Um. Oh yeah, and then those other things we were talking about, those metal scrims, they are actually called. They're sometimes called nets. So if you ever hear something on set that somebody wants a net, that would be those those metal scrims. Oh, good to know. Just take down the light without blocking it or without changing how soft or hard it is. Cool. I think that's all of my notes for that stuff. Does anyone have any questions or comments on, on these things? Again, flags and the scrims are used by the um, grip department, but depending on the set and if you're m mixing the grip department with the electric department, making a grip in and electric department, and um, they're going to be using all of this. That's cool. Yeah, no, it's cool. It's like it's it's good to have like an understanding of all of the pieces and how they work together. Setting them up, like pulling up all the poles and stuff. Once you kind of know how the poles work, that's kind of easy to do that. And then it's just learning about where to place them and how to set it up so that it, you know where they yeah. kind of want them. Because like even if you set it up and then they're like, oh, we need it changed slightly, 
and it's easier but if you're like way off if you don't know anything about it it's a lot harder to that's what i mean it's like oh do i put it uh on the right side no it's on the left side man like you're like 50 feet away from where it's supposed to be but it's just like no we need it in a couple inches (laughs) (laughs) i feel like there's a very big difference (laughs) between those and they also like they'll be if you're trying to get into something like that they'll tell you how many stops of light um and stuff like that so depending on how far you're going into the grip department or the lighting department they'll you'll need to learn more about about that like how what's going to take away a stop of light and stuff like that and then they use those light meters to see how much light's going into that direction and um, different things like that so that they can really know for a fact um, how much light is hitting the subject without just eyeballing it and guessing yeah you know, it's good to know, like, the more specific you can get on everything, that's where everything kind of comes together. First, it's understanding the general, and then it's getting specific on the small shoes. And then when you get to bigger stuff, that's when you get to play around with. Yeah, bigger. and then you get to experiment and kind of figure out how you like it and all that. Yeah, definitely, which is fun. And then also being able to be, like, doing stuff the way other people like it is fun, too. It's like, oh, is that the way you want it? No, pro- I just didn't realize that. No problem. Let's do that. It's yeah. cool to be able to being have able to, being able to know what to do and how to do it in school. Yeah, and being workable. Because that's yeah. huge, I notice. Like people like you to be as workable as possible. They yeah. So mm-hmm. that's I mean, makes the everybody's life easier. I mean, you're not gonna get that perfect. Things happen, la la la. I would just be like, ah, oh, that's not a big deal. Yeah, being proactive instead of just being passive is always better on a set because then you have somebody trying to help solve problems or, you know, try to just do whatever they can to, to help the set go by, which is really cool. Yeah, I think that, that being said, on depending on like what set you're on and how big they are, you might not be able to help certain departments because I know in certain sets, it's for safety reasons. Electrical can only handle the lights nobody else um, and stuff like that. So it depends on what set you're on, of course. But it does. Sometimes passive will win where they don't like on the really big sets where they kind of just want you specifically doing your job and doing it well it's best Mm -hmm. to stay as passive as possible and as workable as possible because like just being there you're gaining experience you're being in there you're seeing it you're being around it and i feel like as they get to know you they'll specifically ask you for more as they know you anyway so it's not like a big deal more so on the smaller stuff it's good to step up but know their timing and pacing and the people around you because people also don't like to feel like their toes are getting stepped on. So that yes, would say- exactly. So it depends on like what set you're on and how the things are, but, but generally, especially if you're just being proactive in the one job you have, like if you're being a production assistant and you overhear someone say they might need something, you already have it when you're ready for it before they even ask, that's always a good thing. And, you know, just things like that also help definitely it just shows that you're paying attention to the best of your ability and then and that you care and if you show that then people are just going to naturally like you more so and I think that that's kind of a good thing I mean I like to get along with everyone that I'm working with my working relationships matter I mean some people like joke around to the extreme I'm kind of not too much that way because I get really attached so I try to keep an even keel. I'm kind of fun. I'll joke around a bit, especially if I get to know people more. But yeah, I don't know. I like cool coworkers. Makes life awesome. Yeah, definitely yeah. You can definitely get better. too comfortable in a work environment to where you let your personality—not you, but I mean, like uh, people in general. I'm like that. I sometimes think, oh, I can be comfortable here, and I joke around a little bit too much, and I forget that it's a professional environment and I should be working. Or that maybe those jokes won't land with everyone and maybe I'm not, I don't know the person <laughs> as well as I think I do. Yeah. So that's no. always, it's always good to go professional first. Even if they Definitely. do give you like an opening, be, a, be like give them a little bit, but not too much. I know I've been in some situations where it's like they were throwing it at me and I would throw it back. Not, not even like just a little bit not, it was such a minor thing but you know certain people are just so finicky there's nothing you can do it's just like it, it, i could have done everything absolutely perfect and it, mm, mm. sometimes <laughs> it's just different personality yeah it just depends like on the who you're working with and stuff like that um, so anyways, you do does anybody have any questions about the the lighting stuff or anything or should we move on to the last, last i like joking though oh i have a question 
yeah, it's fun. So do you have, I mean, this might be at the end of the, 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 the thing, but do you have any examples of like, how I say um, bad lighting? Cause I feel like lighting is like, it's something you don't notice, but when it's bad, you notice it is how I say it. Uh, like, I don't like, have any examples, but you can check them out. I'm sure there's plenty. Uh, it, it also depends on what you're trying to go for, I guess, but. I think the only one I could think of is this, but this movie was budget, budget, budget. So I felt like uh, it didn't feel right to criticize. So something like that, oh, I would say I is bad lighting. Example. Like, you know, I the one on the you... right, because he's out in the sun, we should be able to see him. But because we can't, I would, I would consider that bad lighting. No matter what the scene is, it shouldn't be a bright, sunny day and we can't see the person. Yeah, so stuff like that, like, and that's why like things like bounces come in to play and all these different uh, variations of light Honey, to make it do what you want. I can, a perfect example of bad lighting is the episode in season eight of Game of Thrones where it was super dark and no one could see anything. And they were like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. That one was, oh gosh, that was terrible. People have put the lighting all the way up it was a huge war scene. It was shot at night. I understand the product. Like, there were a lot of people, but the lighting was awful. No one could see it. They said they put their lighting up to like the highest it could be in their TVs and they still could barely see anything. Another thing I think is like bad lighting is just kind of boring lighting. Like it doesn't have any, I like a little bit of, you know, something going on. Like everyone, most people like, you know, yeah, if it's too muted, a little bit of shadow, like they don't like it being exactly even across the board that you can see there's some shadow on her face and some light coming from the other side. If it was all exactly the same, it just kind of gets a little dull. Um, and I've seen that in a lot of independent stuff where I would consider it kind of bad. Um, these all have shadows. So it's not really what I'm thinking, but I, but you can kind of tell, like, there's, like, kind of no color. There's kind of no light anywhere. It's just kind of, like, everything's the same amount of brightness and the same color, and it just makes it all a little more boring and less cinematic. And then there's just overexposure. That's, ex you yeah. know, overexposure is the worst lighting. Yeah, you know, it's all about illusions and things like that. And I think, like, it's important to make it look good and to make sure that the lighting's right because if you're too overexposed or underexposed you're gonna look like shit <laughs> and it's yeah, gonna be you know, really you're gonna see what's going on if you if you have like, too much exposure like, what the fuck is this <laughs> sorry my language but they're gonna be like what is this i can't uh do anything with this it's black the light just lightning in post <laughs> yeah and that doesn't work especially if you're <laughs> overexposed because you can't just when you're overexposed, it kind of like cuts off the data where it doesn't even know what's there. So if you tried to take that picture and you're getting that overexposure, trying to bring it down, it's not going to look like this one in the middle. It's going to be a lot uglier because it's just going to have random white splotches or gray splotches, depending on how you're doing it. Um, so that's that's the absolute worst. Um, when it's under too underexposed or too overexposed, then it's the worst kind of lighting you can get. And that's why you have all these, you know, these different materials, like the diffusion will kind of cut down the light intensity a little bit, and it'll also soften it. And then you have these, the um, indie filters and the things you can put on your camera lenses so that they kind of are wearing sunglasses, basically, so that it's not having that super brightness. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't really, you can, like you said, you, you don't really notice it until you notice it. And I, I guess they're not really going to show me any on, on Google just by looking it up. But I, for me, I just consider bad lighting to be kind of like bland and boring or overexposed or underexposed where you can't see what's going on or it's so overexposed that it's just ugly. Mm. Artists, I'm not sure if this was asked before, but is it true that it's better to be underexposed than overexposed? I had a professor that mentioned that to me. Yeah, um, I've heard that too. It's better to be underexposed because in post you can brighten it up and um, it will still have more detail in the yeah. darks than it will in the if it's overexposed. When it's overexposed, it doesn't have any 
information. It's just a white blotch. So if you, if you bring down the brightness on that, it just turns into a gray blotch. But if you're underexposed, it can sometimes bring up the brightness and, and it doesn't look terrible. It does start to add noise and get a little like, um, those little like spots all over the screen, depending on how underexposed it was. Um, but it is, it is a lot better to be under than it is over. I think um, this reminds me of, um, I don't know if you saw that video. I think it was by Patrick Williams. I think it was called Why a Marvel Movie So Ugly. And it, I think it made me realize like, I think he was talking more about color than lighting, but it's mm -hmm. like when he like brightened up the colors or something and, and fixed it, I just realized how, and I realized, oh my gosh, it does look bad when they don't brighten up the colors. And it's like, it reminded me, yeah, it's something you really don't notice unless someone points it out. So it's like, like, it makes me wonder, like, like the, like, like the- So that part. I wouldn't say is necessarily like, bad i would just say it's kind of like artistic choice compared to like and like if you have to be if it has to be pointed out to you to see it then it's not as bad as like that's what i was know, saying it's like you know, it, it's like it. it makes you like eh, like will i count that as a flaw like now i know but is it do i know because i'm just not used like i just don't know anything about lighting or is it like like for example like a like of a big film like is it valid like because i don't know anything about lighting so mm -hmm. like I wouldn't even know it's bad lighting unless it's really, really bad. So it's well, like, eh, so it's like, yeah. Here's my thinking. As you're learning, you're going to see something and think it's good. And then when you learn more and your eyes adjust, it's not going to look the same. You're not going to be the same person as when you just saw that and if you are then you didn't grow very much in that in that area so I don't think that's a bad idea it's like if you look at a project you made a year ago you're like oh later be like that wasn't very good but you know what where's so the end, I right? think so I think lighting affects us when we can't like most people can forgive bad lighting because either we don't notice it or it's just like uh, it's a little dark or it's a little boring looking um, I think that most egregious is when it's like too dark to where you can't see or too overexposed to where it looks hideous. When it's just boring looking, I feel like we barely notice it. Or we can't tell. We're just like, oh, yeah, something about this movie just feels boring. Unless you're actively looking for it, like, oh, it's the lighting. The light. The lighting is what make, what's making it look boring. But if you, do, for most people, they don't really think, oh, this lighting choice is making it look boring. Or at least I didn't until I started um, watching movies more. And I was like, that's what's making the scene look boring. It just doesn't look engaging. It doesn't look dynamic. It doesn't look interesting. You know, um, I could just be speaking for me. I don't know. But that's something I've noticed. Um, that I will definitely um, notice bad lighting more when it's like I can't see anything or barely anything I'm like oh my gosh this is so dark and annoying um, and that's the thing I'll notice the most and then when it's like overblown I'll just be like oh that looks kind of ugly anyone yeah, else because I mean, some things are like an actual choice that people make and I wouldn't really consider that bad lighting I would just say that's you know that's something that you yeah, like or I don't find Africa. as as good looking as something else but that doesn't necessarily yeah. make it like bad. Battlestar Galactica so kinda... they had this overblown thing sorry honey didn't mean to cut off but they had this overblown thing where it just looked really weird and overblown and kind of like they were going for that to kind of show that the world had been nuked and and it was this apocalyptic thing but it looked really cheap at times and it looked just just plain bad i can't really find it well like there's um, no like, there's no end it ends up being like you have to just make a creative choice and go with it yeah but it was their stylistic choice yeah it was it was the way that they chose to distinguish the world on earth that had just been you know um nuked to the rest of the things that they were going so, yeah and i think like if you're too worried about what you know criticism that's not good if you have no criticism then you're like well i have no point of reference and you'll be way off key and that could be good and you i can think kind of like that is what she's talking about that's what we're yeah yeah like that and and it looked really bad it looked worse than that at times actually it's like way way brighter um 
but yeah, so that was their stylistic choice. I think, like I said, the most egregious um, mistakes you can make in lighting is making it too dark to where the person can't see and overblown to where it just looks ugly, like really, really ugly. If it's a little bit oversaturated, if it's a little bit dull, um, I don't think people will notice it as much. But still, you should strive for the best you can do. But if it's between getting like super duper dark or maybe a little more oversaturated, I feel like the more oversaturated would be best. What do you think, hon? You're talking about you're talking about two different things. You're talking about color and light. Colors different. No, no, I'm talking about lighting in the sense of like, would you prefer something overexposed or underexposed? Under. Overexposed is hideous. You can't even see what's you can't you you literally yeah, can't tell what it is show. when it's too yeah. overexposed. That's like the true, sky, you can't see. TV. You can't. They they did this on purpose, but you can't see what's going on in this sky. It's so overexposed. It's just a white blotch. Um, and that you know, if that was all over the screen, or if that was on half of his face because he's too overexposed from the key light, then it would be hideous, and you couldn't even tell what was going on. So underexposed, I believe, is better than over. Um, yeah, because at least you can correct extent. that a little bit. But then, if you try to overcorrect it, it'll look rainy as heck. So there's also that. Right, but you always want to err on the side of underexposure so you can brighten it up. Because if you did something like uh, her hair right here, it's a little overexposed. If you're trying to, like I said, if you're trying to bring that down, well, there's going to be that white splotch in the middle of her hair that is not going to be able to doesn't have any detail in it. it doesn't know what her hair looks like it just looks white so if you bring the brightness down on that it's just going to look gray which is probably why they left it white because it's going to look worse than when you try to um, correct it because it doesn't have the information it needs the data it needs to to make that picture look good um, but when it's darker you can always brighten it up a little bit and you know it's you can't do everything of course like if with anything you shouldn't rely on post you should always try to get it as best you can on set but overexposure you can't get right in post-production it's not going to look good now if it's just barely you know it's if it's brighter than you'd like it to be it can still get darker and it's not going to ruin it but if it's overexposed to the point where the camera doesn't even know what's there and it just sees something white that's when you can't change it because it's just going to become something gray and hideous, depending on what you're trying to, you know, correct. Quick, you can change it, just will probably not go well. And being able to recognize something that's not going, it's like seeing a crash before you get there, probably best to redirect before you actually land it. In the certain situations, there's not much you can do, but yeah. It's like, I think like it's like that. If you try to, if you like already know. It, well, with overexposure, to... like you literally, like if it's overexposed to the point where the camera doesn't know what's there, you literally can't change it. You can only make it gray or white. Like it doesn't change. Yeah. It doesn't have the the picture information or whatever that, that shows what it is. Um, so if it's overexposed to that point, then yeah. But if it's just like, you know, a little bit brighter than what you'd like, you can always darken it in post as long as it has some kind of picture information there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> All right. Good, um, interesting is good. I like to yeah, hear that. Definitely. That's the way I um, am. I follow that. Have any questions or comments about the that stuff before we go to the boom pole operator? Boom operator. All right. All right. Boom operators. I just have kind of a, like a lot of notes. I don't really have as much to show you. Everything with sound kind of have to hear. Um, some of the videos in the syllabus, they showed very good comparisons on some of these notes. And I'll, I'll kind of explain that as I go. But um, boom operators, they act as a liaison between the camera and sound. They're the ones that are actually like right around the camera department. So they you know, usually are the ones to relay the information coming from that department to the rest of the sound department. Sound department, you might have like a sound mixer that has his own little cart and a, and a mixing board and all that stuff. And he's over somewhere else doing all that so that any incoming um, recordings from different mics, he can adjust on the fly. And then you have like a, a sound utility, which is somewhere else, which is working with all the sound equipment, maybe repairing it or maybe just 
bringing it to the people that need it. And then you have the boom operator, which is actually there with camera on set in the scenes to, to hold that boom pull and capture the sound straight from the actors. So they need to be, um, they need to be able to relay information to the rest of their team. If anything comes up and they're like, Hey, we're miking this person or, Hey, this next scene is going to be canceled or whatever, you know, any information that's coming that the sound department needs to know, they're the first ones to relay that information to them. They usually have a headphones and a boom pole with that shotgun mic, you know, and some of that wind protection looks something like that so that they can point it directly towards the subject, making the, or whatever they're trying to get usually dialogue. So they're going to point it to the people's mouth um, and they're trying to keep it out of frame so that it doesn't go into camera. Um, they can have different lengths of, of boom poles. There's like six feet ones and it goes to like 12 feet, 16 feet. There's really long ones where they can be, if it's a wide shot and they still want a boom pole, they can have, uh, you know, they can be really far out of camera and have that thing go way, extend really close to the actor and just be above frame. That way they're not in the shot, but the boom mic is as close to the actor as possible. And so it takes some strength to be a boom operator. They have to, they have to yeah. be able to hold a lot of that upper thing body for long strength. periods. Yeah. Um, yeah, one definitely. of the videos actually gave some. Oh, sorry, Sarah. Actually, gave some really good tips on how to like hold it and not be tired. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, and I was just thinking like that's it's not an easy job, and oftentimes it's better for like taller people to get that job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, like there's some things you can't get away from, and that's one of them. I mean, it right. makes sense. <laughs> yeah, some jobs are just for the taller people. <laughs> I mean, there's some jobs like acting that could be like any person, but yeah, some some things is like specifically, and it's like, why would you want to if you're five feet tall? <laughs> <laughs> you can though. I mean, there's certain tools that I mean, would let you. It's just, to, it would be a little can. harder. It'd probably be a lot yeah. easier for a taller person, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you can. There are big. <laughs> I know. I said you can. It would just be again. easier no, for the other saying, person that's taller. Platform shoes are in again. They can take advantage <laughs> of that. You know. Yeah, maybe. Or are they out? I don't know. These things are hard to follow. But um, at some point, people were wearing them again. So. so boom operators, they need to bring or have their own sun blocking material or cloth for the sunny days. Like, you know, those neck, uh, I don't know what they're called, but you put them on the back of your neck and it wraps around so that it's not a scarf, but it's like a thing that you put so it doesn't have yeah, the sun. They yeah, say, they say it's better than sun block oil because it'll get on your equipment. It might get on your lenses. They you know it might get all gross and oily and so they recommend if you can and then of course like winter clothes and scarves gloves with the fingers out so that they can grab that pole and they're going to be i'll be explaining that a little bit later but um for cold days they want to have that kind of gear so that they don't get cold because if they're shivering they don't want to be shaking the mic around the pole is going to make noise every time they shake it around like that so they're trying to keep it as still as possible um so they'll, they'll, they need to bring all that stuff or have that around just in case. And like Priscilla said, if you're if they use lotion or sunblock, those have those are kind of greasy, and that'll make it one. It'll make it harder to hold the pole because it'll be slippery, and you don't want to accidentally drop that, especially not into an actor's face. Um, but you also don't want to get it on your gear and all of that when you're when you're putting when you're messing with all these mics and things. So you don't want to get it all gross and slimy. So they say like, no, they don't usually use it unless they absolutely have to. Usually they just try to like cover up with some kind of cloth to stay out of the sun. Um, like I said, they aim the boom pole at the mouth whenever they can. That's because those, those shotgun mics we learned about, they're, they're very directional. So they have what's called on axis, which is gonna be the direction in which the sound picks up the best. And if it goes off axis, it sounds a little worse or it sounds quieter. So they always wanna be pointing that on axis, which is straight ahead, right where the sound is coming from. If there's two actors talking, they're gonna be having the pull in between them and kind of shifting back and forth ever so slightly so that they can be pointing at each one's mouth when it's their turn to speak. Or if, well, <clears throat> excuse me, or if they're both speaking at the same time, they'll probably, well, first of all, they'll probably have lavalier mics on them, strapped somewhere. And then they'll also have the, the um, shotgun mic somewhere in the middle to capture both of them equally. 
Um, they need to have an eye for where they are in the frame. Keep in communication with the camera operator to make sure they're not in the shot. They need to watch out for the shadows and where lights are set up so that they're not casting shadows in the frame. If there's a light, the lights are behind him right now in this picture, so he's good. If the light was closer, like coming straight towards the actor, he would have to be somewhere else because otherwise he's gonna cast a huge shadow on her, the background, the pole's gonna cast a shadow. So they always need to pay attention to where the lights are gonna be set up um, so that they know where they're allowed to move within frame. That makes sense. I like that. You need to, you need to know all that stuff. It's like the technical stuff is cool because it's like if you know where the lights are set up, you know where the pointing, you know where the camera's looking, you know where to hold the pole, you know where the actors walk in, how the, and then it, then boom. Yeah, you have a and then you just have, you know where you can be and where you can't. And the more you get used to it, the more you know like how how far your reach is and all of that kind of thing where you where you can walk and the more you pay attention to things, the better off you're going to be, especially if you're going to do a job like this. Oh, definitely. And it's it's hard to take in all of the information at once because it's a lot to take in, but you just yeah. <laughs> do it more and more and you just get good at it. I mean, people that have like were born into it, it's like not the same as like somebody coming in like us learning about it and jumping in. You right. know what I mean? It's just like if you because you're, you're you've taken your environment. So yeah. So the longer you're in the environment, the more you take in, the more you know, and then boom, you just know stuff. And like, if you practice it, you'll get good. So I wouldn't be too worried as long as you know something when you show up, then you can learn the rest. If you know absolutely nothing, you're like, what's a boom pole? Probably shouldn't be a line <laughs> for boom pole job. So I'm the balance. Like those are the guys that are like, you have to know every single little detail before you do. I'm like, okay. Yes and no, depending what you're doing. Know as much as you can, but don't be like, I'm not the number one boom pole holder in the entire world. I can't apply. No, that's right. excessive. Somewhere in the middle. <laughs> don't right. be like, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. So you always want to, you always want to be aware and try to get as much information as you can. But of course, if you're trying for a job like boom operator, you're going to not really understand it as well until you're doing it. And then you're going to be able to, you know, see a lot better um and understand a lot better and, and stuff like that so you know as we're learning about this though it's also good to know what that boom operator should be doing so when you're on a set you kind of know what they need to be paying attention to if they're new to it you can even try to help them out and be like hey you know really pay attention to this and that because you know you're going to cast shadows if you're over here and so if they're new and you're and you're trying to have them on your set still at least you know what you know what should be done so that they you don't have to rely fully on them um, but it does take a lot of like onset experience to learn all these things. So, but it's good Definitely to kind of in the, learn in the smaller stuffs where you get to really get hands on and, and learn the basics of kind of more costs, um, more jobs, and you can kind of do higher positions because there's not as many people. Too so small, you learn nothing. Kind of taking it's over more like jobs. So like, if you're like, it's a three person crew and we're just doing a quick shot, you're probably not going to learn much about set deck or anything. It's somewhere in the middle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse you. All right. Um, so if the actors are staying still for a long period of time, if it's something like an interview or something like that, they might just put the boom mic on what's called a boom stand, which is this thing right here. And that way the operator doesn't have to hold it for long periods of time. They can just, you know, set it on this, point it to the person. And if the person's kind of sitting in the same direction or sitting still, then it doesn't really matter um, if, if someone's holding it or not. Only reason someone's holding it is so that they can, you know, move it back and forth between different things or follow the actor or move around with camera or whatever, something like that. But if it's just like a still scene where someone's sitting in the same spot, they're not turning around and all over the place. Then you can have something like this, hold the, hold the mic and point it towards them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they all, the boom operators also need to pay attention to reflective surfaces. Be sure they're not seen in the reflection or the boom pole is not seen in the reflection. You'll see this sometimes in like somebody does a car scene and the person's outside the car Sometimes you'll see the boom or the person or the camera operator in the reflection of the window. And uh, you don't want that. You want them to, you know, that takes people out of the movie. If they see it, if they spot it, or they just feel like something's off or something's weird. 
um, that'll take them out of the movie. So you don't want that. So you always want to have, like, if you're doing the shot, the boom operator, if you're being camera operator, you want to be aware of reflective surfaces and things like that to make sure you're not seen within the frame. Um, usually, if you're a boom operator, you're trying to get the mic as close as possible without being in the frame. That's why they have such long boom poles so that they can get it as close to their mouths as possible. When there is movement, the operator will be sure to keep the mic pointed to the subject. So of course, mm -hmm. if this lady right here in this picture is gonna walk to the left as she's talking, he's gonna move with her or he's gonna point the mic with her as she walks so that it's picking up the same sound and she's not walking off, getting off axis and then it sounds worse. Then if she, that's why you have to keep that uh, mic pointed at her to keep it on axis so it stays the same level and quality of sound. Cool. If there's also camera movement and character movement, the operator needs to match the movement of the camera operator and <laughs> still keep the boom out of frame. And those is when it gets really hard because they have to make sure they're not tripping over anything. They had to make sure that they are keeping up with the camera operator and also pointing the mic at the actor while out of frame. So it's a lot of things going on at once once you start getting into those more difficult movement shots. Um, they say like when you're extending the pole that you should start with the top portion first because they have these different screws. Let me see if I can. So kind of like, oh man, I just want a picture. Something like that. So you should extend that first section first um, because if you extend the bottom section out and you need to extend it later while during a take, that next portion is gonna be farther away from your reach. So that's why you start with the top, point it out and then start going down as you go. Cause then all these three will be next to you. All right, bye Brent, thanks for coming tonight. Hi, Brett. And that way, if you need to extend it further, um, you can, and there's no no problem. So just if you're if you're doing that, um, start from the start from the top, work your way back. Yeah, they also say if if you're a boom operator, don't put your boom pole on the ground or leaning against a wall. As they've seen it a bunch. People will put it against a wall. It has this mic on it, this equipment. Somebody walks over, they trip on that cable, they hit it, they you know, thud the wall too hard and it slides, smashes, and either breaks, causes damage, or you know, just doesn't look good. So you know, if you're a boom operator, or if you have a boom operator, make sure they're not putting the mics and the boom pole on the wall or on the floor, because that's just not gonna. It's uh, gonna kind of ruin it. Hey, honey. Hey. They also want to be sure not to be in the way and keep kind of a low profile. Don't be distracting since they're around everybody. They don't want to be like, you know, talking to the actors while the director's trying to get their attention or, um, you know, keeping the camera operator or the camera assistants distracted by talking to them or, or asking them questions while they're supposed to be focusing on their work. How if it's turned off? I mean, it's on earbuds. You can hear right now. Oh, dang it. So the other thing boom operators need to do is, is whenever an actor is having a rehearsal, they need to watch those rehearsals, especially a blocking rehearsal. That'll show where the actors are going to go and where they're going to be on set. And the, you know, the boom operator needs to point the mic at the people having um, the dialogue. So they need to know who's going to say their lines, when, where they're going to be, um, so that they know where they need to be and where they need to be pointing that mic. They also say avoid having their camera to their back. They want to be near camera, but they don't want camera to get away from them. So they should have the camera to the side or in front of them so that they always know where that camera operator is going to be um, so they can match their steps and so they cannot get into frame. 
So never have their back pointed towards the camera operator. So then they won't know where they're going to go. Um, boom operators also usually arrive 30 minutes early to set and they help out their sound mixer. Oh, that's the other thing. They answer to the sound mixer. So the sound mixer is above them um, in the hierarchy. And then it's them and they're, they're answering to them, helping them out. They, they need to know the call sheet in and out because the call sheet will tell them who's going to be there, what actors, and what scenes they're going to do so that they know who they need to mic. Uh, they need to be able to judge distance without being able to measure it. So the more, you, the more they do it, excuse me, the more they do it, the more they need to be able to be like, hmm, well, they seem like they're about this far away and can kind of unscrew their pull and point the mic over there and be like, okay, yeah, that distance. So they need to be a good judge of that so that they can um, kind of already have their mic ready before it even begins so that they know how far they need to extend it and just be a good judge of, um, of guessing how far and how close and however much they can uh, keep their boom pole extended or in. They need to know these different booming positions, which I don't know if they show them. Since they're holding this boom pole all day, they need to know some different positions that will, you know, not. Why is it doing this? Yeah, that was weird. Um, they need to know these different positions so that they're not hurting themselves. I don't know why it's doing sex positions, but anyway. Um, so they're gonna be holding that a long time. So they need to know what's causing the least amount of, um, that's gonna make them tired the least. They need to be able to hold it, be able to rest it. Something like this right here. They're gonna be um, like holding it up like that and then being able to rest it on their shoulders in between takes. And then, you know, like the different positions if they have to go from underneath, even though most of the time they want to do on top, sometimes you'll, the uh, set won't be able, won't allow it. So they'll have to go up from underneath. And so they need to know like how to hold it, how to position it so that they can um, have the best grip and handle on it because they want to be really loose with the way they hold it. You don't want to be too tight because any movement you make, if you're holding it too tight, you're going to move your entire body and it's going to tire you out more. And so it's going to make more noise. So they say to hold it kind of loose and um, to be able to just like adjust your fingers on the pole to make it slightly slant back and forth, especially if there's two actors, they'll hold it up, but then they'll use their fingertips to slightly move it back and forth. So the boom mic goes um, from one actor to the other back and forth in that fashion. So there's actually a lot of like technique to it and a lot of things that they need to know to make sure that they aren't locked into position. Um, because also the other thing is you might lock off your shoulders into a position or your elbows, and then you're not really able to keep up with the actor because you're too, too tight. Your positioning and, and everything is, you know, you're not holding it loose enough. So you, you're, it takes too much effort or too much time to unlock yourself and get it into a different position. And then you might ruin the shot. And you never want to do that. Um, it's uh, one of the videos we're showing, like some of the some of the different resting positions that you can do. We saw that one on the shoulders. There was also one where they just kind of put it on their shoe. That way, it's not on the ground, but it's um, but it's can be rested like vertically, where they just stand it straight up on their shoe just to kind of get it off their arms so that they're not holding it all day. Um, and so it doesn't get dirty and broken and scuffed if they're scraping it across the ground, of course. Yeah, and you have to take breaks. Like with all the equipment, you have people standing by to, um, especially like as it gets heavier, you have a camera operator. And then I've seen it, they have people like actually help take the weight off when they're not shooting. Same thing with like a really long pole. I'm sure like the shorter ones, it's not as much of a load, but as you get, it's good right. to be able to pull it down and 
So yeah, and that's why they don't want to just like have the you know the boom operator just put it somewhere on this on the wall or whatever. They they usually have their own little cart, their uh, caddy or something like kind of like a golf cart where they can put the pole and it, like it stands straight up when they're on break or going on lunch or something like that. And um, the sound utility person will sometimes stand in for the boom operator if they need to go to the bathroom or um, what it, whatever, and and they still need somebody to hold boom. Um, so that's also something to kind of alleviate the stress of holding that thing all day, because as you can see, if it's extended out that long, it's going to start, you know, being very, um, tiresome after a while. Yeah, definitely. It's repetitive motion or yeah. like repetitive hold. It's just like, you know, it's like one thing lifting weights at the gym, but try to just hold those for a long time. Like that's those guys with yeah. were like, why <laughs> the long arms and then it's like mm. yeah and they have to hold it steady like it's it's i would say boom pole operator is probably actually one of the hardest jobs i can only imagine <laughs> it is it's very it's very uh physical like it's a very physical task to, to be able to do it all day and yeah. one kind of like steady cam operating where you need to you know have the technique down so you're not just constantly wearing yourself down so it has a lot of technique like that yeah, I wouldn't want to be the pole guy. I'm too short anyway. <laughs> Me too. I'm like five six. So yeah. Yeah, I'm five five. So like no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So they say you want to start. Um, usually, what the boom operator wants to do is start in frame, and then gradually raise the boom pole up until they're out of frame. That's a lot easier than starting from the top and going down, because then you're like, "Am I in? Am I in? Am I in?" Instead of just being like, "Let me know when I'm out," and then the camera operator is like, "There you go, right there." So they try to keep it like as close to the actor as possible, but not being in frame, which means pretty much if the camera goes up even a little bit, um, it's going to see the boom pole. It's gonna be, it's gonna see the shotgun mic. Um, so it depends on how shaky the camera operator is too. If they're just doing handheld or if they're doing like a semi handheld kind of motion, the boom operator has to be higher up to account for the camera moving up and down. Um, so those are the things. That's why they need to be in good communication with the camera department so that they can be like, hey, let's do a test run, make sure we're getting in this right so that I'm not in the way, you're not messing up, and we get this done so no one's looking at us. Because nobody wants to be the person that messes up the take and has to, oh, we have to redo it because the sound guy got in. Oh, we have to redo it because the, you know, the camera operator messed up. So that's why these, these teams need to be good, personable people to be able to communicate and work effectively together and why it's such a team effort. <laughs> Um, they said sometimes you'll want to extend the boom pole out all the way and then lower it a few inches before locking each segment so that there's more support for each um, each segment so those things the each segment where you unscrew it and, and extend it out you don't want it all the way out because then it's going to be leaning all the way against that weight if you need it if you have to extend it all the way out that's the only time that they recommend doing that. Otherwise, they, they say however much you have to extend it out, just extend it out fully and then bring it back a little bit um, with each, each different segment of the boom pole. That way it has more support and that way it doesn't feel as heavy. It doesn't have as much weight going toward the boom of the uh, shotgun mic. Yeah, that makes sense. You don't wanna over, like put strain on your equipment for no reason, so. Yeah, it's just not just not just on the equipment. It's also on you because there'll be more yeah. weight leaning that way. And Definitely, if you don't yeah. need it, then don't. You know. Yeah, exactly. It's just like don't just work smarter, not harder. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the thing with the fingertips. They say that's uh, what's called cueing the actor. So if these three actors are all going to be talking, he's going to be using his his left arm to use his fingertips to kind of just adjust where this mic is so mm -hmm. that it's going toward her, the guy in the middle or the guy on the left. And then he'll just kind of use his fingertips to go back and forth so that it's not making any noise, but it's also very gradually and smoothly going to each person when they have their lines. And that's uh, cueing or cueing an actor is what it's called whenever they're getting ready to do their lines, they'll. You know, cue them with the pull by, you know, bringing the pull over towards them. 
or, or using their fingers to aim it towards them. Um, the front arm is the support arm and the back arm is for tilting and panning. So this guy right here, his left arm is just for holding it and you know, using his fingers with the, with the other hand as well to kind of adjust where it is. But the back mm -hmm. arm will be if he needs to tilt it up or tilt it down or pan it left or pan it right, he'll use his back arm for that, which would be his right arm. And then you can use both arms to extend in or out of frame. Um, they say also you want this shotgun mic to be at an angle towards the actor. For some reason that picks up better sound so it doesn't go straight down at them or straight towards them. You can see it has a slight angle towards that guy. Um, something to do with how it picks it up. It just picks it up a little better if it's at an angle. So that's usually the way they want to do it. Um, there's also these shotgun mics with what's called flat off axis. And that means they'll still have good audio when it's off axis, it'll just be lower volume. So if you get a shotgun mic, they're probably more expensive, I'm assuming, I don't know, but I'm assuming it's more expensive to get one like this because that means they're not, um, with shotgun mics, like the one I have, if, if I'm off axis, if it's coming from the side, like if, if, if I was in this scene and that lady's talking, the sound is gonna sound awful because it's coming from the side and those mics are not meant to pick up sound from the side. So they don't pick it up very well from the side. They're actually meant not to pick up sound from the side. So um, that way they could be way more directional. So if she's off axis or even if the guy in the middle is talking, it's gonna sound not that great. But if you have a mic that's, called, that's flat off axis, they're just gonna sound quieter but they'll still sound as good of uh, quality, which I found pretty interesting. They said that they, they um, the boom operators will really take advantage of this by pointing the mic towards someone who's a little quieter, like actually quieter in real life speaking. That way the off axis will lower the volume of the other person. Um, and then they're kind of like speaking at the same volume level. The one, the quieter one gets the, the more of signal from the mic and the other one gets the off axis because they actually speak louder. And that way they both end up being around the same volume. I thought that was interesting. That is interesting. The last thing they said is if you don't need the full length of the pole, well, that's not, sorry, not the last thing, but another thing they said is if you don't need the full length of the pole, consider fully extending it and then grabbing it from the middle so that there's not as much weight fighting against you. So if, if you have a boom operator who's struggling and they're like, gosh, this is so tiring, you don't want them to be holding the mic all the way at the end. You might want them to extend it fully and then hold it from the middle so that there's some weight in the other side as well. And that'll help even the load. So that's another um, tip that they were talking about. Um, a boom operator might also have to perform small repairs of audio equipment. So they need to be well-versed in audio equipment and how it functions, how it works and how you can repair it because they might have to do these small repairs. Nothing intense, nothing crazy. Like I'm not gonna tell them, oh, fix this entire broken mic, but they might be like, hey, this thing's making a slight popping noise. See if you can figure it out. And sometimes it's just something loose in the connections. And so they need to kind of figure it, they need to kind of know how to um, be able to fix that problem. They also are the ones who mic the talent with the lavalier mics. And that yeah. can be kind of awkward depending on where you need to mic them at. So that's why they need to be very personable and very comfortable to work with because they're gonna be miking actors. And when you're, when you're miking an actor with a lavalier mic, sometimes you have to mic them around the bra or, or go up through their shirt with the, with the cord or cable. Sometimes an actor will say they can do it themselves and that's great. But occasionally they're just like, yeah, sure, go ahead. So they need to be able to speak with them, make them make sure they're comfortable before they just like start going, hey, I'm going to go up through your shirt with this uh, cord and cable. Um, so that can be kind of awkward. That can be kind of a, an issue if they're treating it, they're mistreating it. So that's also why they need to be personable and, and comfortable to work with and, and a, you know, good communication so that they can be like, hey, you know, are you okay with this? Am I? 
Not good. I'm going to attach it right here. That kind of thing. I think it's good to be personable in pretty much all jobs on a film set, which yeah. most of the time you don't have a problem, but you'd be surprised. Sometimes like just things happen and it could be, it can be hard. Mm-hmm. And, and I find that if you notice that the best thing to do is to not, if somebody is snappy with you, it's just to let it roll because, you know. Yeah, you don't want to cause days, a fight on set. So sometimes you just want to kind of like, whatever. It's not a big deal. Yeah. At the end of the day, yeah. it's not really a big deal. If you do have a problem or, or you were hurt, you could just, the best solution is just to be like, hey, that bothered me. And then yeah. the problem solves very quietly. But I feel like you should also feel comfortable to express yourself if you feel uncomfortable. If you That's would prefer, like some people, for example, would be like, oh, can maybe a, a girl do it? And don't be annoying about it. Like, okay. And then maybe ask someone to do it. Because some people, you know, have their traumas or whatever reason. They don't like other men touching them. So that's a thing as well. So I feel like it's okay to be like, yeah, sure. We'll try to do this. So just being, oh, can you just, you're being difficult or whatever. Yeah, I can understand that. I mean, I prefer to just go with the flow and do whatever yeah, I'm just saying we can do to make but... obviously yeah you would you would explain like I'm not gonna touch you anywhere I'm just gonna put this here but you never know what someone went through or is going through or whatever so like sometimes they might feel more comfortable if someone else did I don't know that's just my yeah, personal no, opinion it, it makes um, sense I yeah. agree with that 100% I prefer to just feel like I'm pretty cool with everybody but I mean and it is good to be safe and to always ask definitely I'm with right. you on especially if you're doing it. something like you know my hands my hand talent you need to make sure they're comfortable with you because you can like you know touch them or you're gonna have to put it on their bra or you're gonna have to go up through the shirt with the cable to make sure to hide it that kind of thing yeah no that's true it's good to and then it, the best thing to do is like if you're super pro about it in keeping it pro because that's what you know it's like if you're a doctor or whatever you mean you right Keep it professional. Be respectful and don't cause a problem, and there's no problems because right. by you. So it's the last thing about the boom acting. operator. What? What? I said it's harder when you get into acting because you have to play parts that say like you're that respectful person all the time. That's like that as crew member. But if you're an actor, you might be playing a part that doesn't like to be touched by men, or you might be playing a part you. And then it gets weird because if you're playing different characters and you bring them to set. And it's like you also, everyone on set has to realize that if you're doing a character in a specific way, personality, that. Yeah. It, yeah you try I would assume that would be hard to like jump in and out of for sure. But yeah. if you're doing a super intense scene or whatever, then. But I'm just saying, there's no yeah, issue there's in asking happening. and being like, hey, are you comfortable? Can I do this? Oh, yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. And if the person's like, I'm sorry, um, is there any way a female could do it? I would just feel more comfortable that way. Just like maybe get a, a female staffer and ask her, hey, can you, I'll direct you on how to do it, but can you help this person? You know, I just feel like little things like that make a world of difference to the talent and to the person and to the people working with you. And it's not that hard to accommodate sometimes. I would assume, it's- I would assume that it wouldn't be that big of an issue most of the time because they're used to, you know, every step they go on, they're going to have to be mic'd up. So, I mean, they're used to it. And it's no, not I like know, people- but like, are being unprofessional with it. So I, I would assume, but it, like we were saying, that's what we're saying. It's just like be, you know, that's why they need to make sure just be communicative and be like, hey, you know, this is okay, right? And then they can say, yeah. And they having, can be like, oh, I'll do it myself. And, you know, something like that. So Yeah, yeah. You can be like, would you like to do it? I can direct you on how to do it. Yeah, there you go. That's a perfect solution. Right. Um, I also just mean like, because you're working with these people for the first time, sometimes they don't know you, you know, people have their own things, especially when it's new talent, it's not someone who's used to it. Um, but yeah, I just, I'm, I'm just looking at it from all these perspectives because you never know. But definitely, I feel like that's a good, you gave a really good um, alternative, honey, just being, okay, if you're comfortable, you can do it. I'll just direct you on how to do it. Anyway, the last thing about boom operators is on low budget productions, the boom operator and the sound mixer are usually the same person and they're referred to as the sound recorder. 
So that just means they're doing everything on set. They're obviously not going to be able to mix it while they record it, but um, they'll be able to kind of preset it and do tests beforehand so that they can capture it as good as they can get it with just being a one person, um, a one, one man band or whatever. Which isn't as fun. It's better with the team. A one man band kind of, it's like, it's, it's a lot harder to get it done. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it's just not fun. I mean, I prefer what's it called um, a team. Honestly, a one man band is like, might as well just go get hired in a position and go that way. Then I don't know, just one by yourself. Just, yeah. Really yeah, I mean, it just depends on like how, how big the not, budget is and stuff, though, you know? Yeah, no, especially like if the, the you're working on a low budget thing, like the sound department's probably only going to be able to consist of one person because they can't afford to pay two to three people. But it is always no, better to have a sense. team of people to do. But um, then you still the want a team with the set. I'm talking when you say one man band, I mean, like, where you're doing everything. You have the camera, you have the lights. Oh, like, yeah. And it's not going to turn out very good either if you're going to try to do everything. No, I mean, I get one person <laughs> in each department on the small stuff. That's not what I'm saying. You're still on a team. Right. And in those in, in in those cases, it's more like the whole every department works closely together. Yeah. So it's like that's the team aspect. When you get really big, then your whole department becomes your team, and it becomes more segregated. Yeah. Um, and small right. ones, it's the whole production's the team. Um, yeah. So I got you. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments about boom operators? Anything I left out, got wrong, that kind of thing. I'm good. All right, cool. So that was everything for today. Um, for for Monday, we're going to be going over these very popular um, ways of lighting for like a portrait photography and or just you know any kind of movie. You'll see a lot of this <clears throat> in different scenes if you look for it. Rembrandt lighting, and well, that's like where they have the little triangle under one cheek. We've kind of learned about that last semester and this one a little bit, but we'll delve deeper into it. Uh, I still don't know how to pronounce this one, but I think it's like chiaroscuro lighting. It's a different way of doing it. A lot of people do it. We'll, we'll check it out and see what it, what it is. Motivated lighting. We talked about this with practicals. Um, we'll delve a little deeper into that, what it means um, and how to achieve it. Sound decibels. This is going to be really important for your recording levels, where and, and what it means. Um, so that you know how loud to record your audio so you don't get into uh, to the editing and and figure out that it's too loud and it's making these annoying like <sighs> noises or that it's too quiet and you have to boost it up and it's going to add in some extra noise that you don't want because you have to boost it so high artificially. And those are the things we'll be going over for Monday. And then starting after Monday next week, we're going to we're going to actually start our first exercise. So everyone just get ready for that. It's going to be a clean Sounds audio good. exercise. We'll record 15 to 30 second video clip, um, phones or whatever you have available. It doesn't matter. Um, you're just trying to get it as good as you can. So you, that might mean you need to go away from, if you only have the phone for audio, you might need to like back up to yell and then come close to whisper so that it picks it up at the same level. But you just don't want to try yelling into it and having it make that popping noise where you can't, affect it later like the if it's doing that that's not going to come out good so you always want you want to try to um, do whatever you can with whatever equipment you have available to try to get yelling and whispering in the same clip 15 to 30 second clip um, that has a you know pretty good audio or at least the best that you can get with what you have and that's that what we'll be using that in, in more things as we learn more about sound and we'll be doing more things with that video clip later on so just try to be creative with it however you want to go about doing it but we'll be starting that next week so we'll talk about this again on monday sounds um, fantastic i'm looking forward to it and doing all the things and it, it and it, you know what it's these little things but it all ends up coming together and i appreciate everything yeah so. and it'll be really fun to, to try out and see how everyone does and the creative differences and all that so yeah so, it as well you don't want us to record it right now i mean you can if you want, I would just wait until, you know, after Monday and we can start because it's not going to be due. We're not going to go over it and look at each other's until October 11th. So it's a few weeks after that. Um, I'm giving everyone like two, I think it's like two weeks to to get it done and, and to have it available at the uh, for that meeting. 
when we actually look at everyone, at, listen and look at everyone's. So thanks for coming. That's going to be the end of the recording.